I'm honored to be here, but I have to admit, when I got the call from Khalil, I was a little taken aback trying to figure out why me, right? What, what, is it, what is it that I've done? He said, well, your accomplishments in your career. And I had to think, uh, gee, I guess this was around the same time I'd gotten a call the week before from the History Channel. And the History Channel said, we'd like to talk to you about modern electric cars that you've been working on for 20 years. It's really been 20 years almost that I started uh, uh, working on battery-operated cars in one way, shape, or form. And so I guess maybe I have been here a long time, long enough to deserve this award for which I am honored and, and pleased. Um, so what have I done? Um, this industry that I'm in kind of brought together two of my adolescent hobbies of cars and computers all at once. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. And the real question is, um, have I learned anything, right? What have I learned? What did I learn here at the university? What, uh, what have I learned in the industry? These are some of the books that I had while I was here. Um, in some ways, I've become outdated, much like some of these books. Some of them still matter today. Some of them are nothing but uh, a history lesson in, in some regards to the processes and things that they talk about that, that aren't really there anymore. Um, I've continued to learn uh, since my graduation in 1984, which seems like a long time ago when you say it. Uh, but most of my learning has really been in business, the business of developing new technology and getting it into the consumer's hands, which is another reason why I really like the auto industry and why when I had the opportunity to be in it, I said, this is going to be great because everybody I know has a car. And now here I am working on the idea that maybe everybody I know won't own a car, they'll just use them every now and then. Kind of interesting to think about that evolution. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how the business and technology of automobiles has changed over the last 40 years. So while some of the facts I've learned are certainly outdated, I, I learned a way of thinking while I was here, too. Here we see uh, Professor Trevor Mudges, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately, his ECE 365 lab. Don't ask me how this picture was taken, nobody really knows. Uh, it just was in an archive that we found around here. And this was just after the PDP-8s, if anybody remembers those, were replaced with Z80s, right? And uh, he had just uh, finished completing putting these things uh, uh, into the lab in the fall of 1979. The real question we thought for a while, is that Trevor Mudge there on the left? And then once we checked the hair, we said, no, it's not him. <laughs> so... And for those of you who know Trevor today, all that black hair is now stark white. So I had a number of problems in this class that I needed to uh, deal with and learn how to, how to uh, troubleshoot and how to solve. Uh, but one of my biggest problems was actually with perception. And I don't mean perception in the way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, perceiving the environment around me for an autonomous car, but more in how was I perceived by the professor himself. See, one evening, Professor Mudge came down to the laboratory. He was walking around, you know, and he walked past my station, and I thought, oh, here's my big chance to make a great, uh, a great impression on this professor who's been teaching me all these wonderful things. And so I said to him, good evening, Professor Mudge. And he stopped. He looked at me, and he paused for a minute, you know, I figured he was just trying to remember who I was. And he looked at me and he went, I know you. You're the guy who sleeps in the front row. <laughs> so I was, of course, mortified. And I had a new problem to solve, right? What was I going to do about this perception that he had of me? Answer, coffee. And I started drinking coffee every day before I went to his class. And I've never stopped. It seems like it's a, it's a perpetual thing now, seven days a week. So... So, did the coffee work? That's the real question. I also found in my books a copy of my transcript, and I'd just like to point out there's an A-plus up there in his class. So, uh, very important. Don't mind the E directly above it. That's what happened. Yeah, just we'll ignore that part, right? But uh, in his class, A-plus. So, um, the fact that I had an opportunity in high school, though, to 
to work on computers and computer programming probably contributed to this uh, relatively good grade in this class. I had the luck to have access to a time-shared operating system that was run by basically my school system, where uh, I was able to learn a lot about computer programming. And what I really liked about computers is they did exactly what you tell them to do, even if it's wrong. And they do it over and over and over again, which makes it relatively easy to troubleshoot sometimes. Programming was almost like a hobby to me in that regard. Um, I also had another hobby in high school, which was cars. Although at the time they were not very sophisticated, you know, they were basically, uh, if, you, if you were to take one apart and look at the electrical wiring harness in a car in that era, it was no bigger around than my thumb. And this might have been the, the biggest place uh, that it was. Today you'll find them as big around as your forearm in some cars in certain places. Um, my neighbor, who worked at General Motors, would bring home all these new model cars all the time. And he had no problem with me completely pouring over them, opening the hood, playing with them, taking out the owner's manual, trying to figure out how they worked. Of course, again, they were mostly simple electromechanical items. Uh, but the great thing is, is that he worked, uh, he was in the finance department, and he did the books for the personnel department. And so when I was looking for a summer job, he knew exactly who I could talk to. And so that was great. I was in. Summer job, working uh, while I'm going to school here. Very helpful, certainly in paying the bills. But the problem was they didn't really know what to do with a computer engineer. So when they called me up and said, you've got a job in information systems, which is basically data processing, of course, I said nothing and was just happy to take it. And so what was I doing? I was writing little programs, sorting data, uh, actually looking at security violation data. As I think about it now, something we would call cybersecurity or looking for trends. Uh, hard to believe that this day and age, people make a whole a living out of doing nothing but that, analyzing data and looking for security violations. So they basically offered me a job as a mainframe console operator working on third shift in the middle of the night which was a little disruptive to my social life, but certainly, again, paid the bills. What was the best part of that job, though? Best part of that job was on my lunch break, I could walk across the street and go over to where they were actually building all of the new model cars that weren't on the street yet. And I could see them in various stages of build. Sometimes it was just the chassis, sometimes it was just the body, sometimes they had things strewn all over the place, but every day you'd go over there and they'd be a little more built, a little more built, a little more built, then eventually they'd be sitting down in the parking lot, if you will, ready for shipping out to our test grounds. So get a chance there to see early on what was really going on inside the company that I would go to work for. So coming here today has caused me to look back at my industry and think about the changes. Again, the technology in this 1970s era uh, convertible, which I think was the last one of its kind, although they have come back, again, was a very, uh, very untechnologically uh, advanced in today's way of thinking, right? Incandescent headlamps, uh, a, a discrete transistor radio, at least there were no vacuum tubes, right? We got rid of those. Um, and uh, balanced analog circuits to turn the headlights on and off automatically if you had that option, right? No digital, no digital anything, really, in these cars. Um, and even more interesting, a vacuum-operated cruise control system, complete closed loop with a variable vacuum valve that was controlled mechanically. So uh, the mechanical engineers were hard at work in this car, believe me. But since then, right, the available electrical and electronic technologies have changed a lot everywhere, including in the auto industry, allowing us to go from this to this, right? The Chevy Volt, a highly complex, highly integrated, modern automobile, complete with cloud connectivity, and not one, but two powertrains banged into one, right? It operates as a full electric car, and then operates as a hybrid after that. All of it in, inside the same space, actually much smaller than the space of the engine compartment of that previous car that you saw. So having been a part of it, this transition, it's, it's been my observation that the change in complexity is something that we really have to go through or had to go through because consumers continue to 
ask for more new features, but this added complexity combined with business forces has really made it so that it takes more people, more resources, and more time to develop and deploy new automotive products. Now you think about that and you say, doesn't that sound a little backwards, right? But think about how we've had to improve overall reliability and durability of cars in the last 40 years. You know, today, a consumer may be willing to accept that on their cell phone, their Pandora app locks up every now and then, right? But they're not going to accept the idea that I'm going to be late to pick up my kid from soccer who's going to be standing out there, maybe in the rain, because some embedded system hiccuped, right, and left me with an uncharged electric car or something like that, right? The level of reliance, I mean, we're all pissed off when our cell phone locks up, right? But it's not something that's going to spoil your day completely, unless you're day trading or something like that. But we'll, we'll ignore that one for a minute. So, and if you think about it, taking it to the next level, right? Here we have one of our uh, autonomous vehicles that we're using for development in San Francisco. And they're certainly not going to tolerate, consumers are certainly not going to tolerate if this vehicle that's taking them somewhere can't finish the trip safely and with comfort. So, just if things have evolved in the auto industry, so have they here at the university, right? Gone are the key punch machines of my freshman and sophomore years. Anybody, anybody, how many people have even used a key punch machine? Okay, a few people with gray hair like myself. And okay, we'll go with that. And of course, they've been replaced, right, by state-of-the-art workstations that can connect to almost anything you can want to connect them to. Right, and keyword here being connect, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So today I want to talk to you briefly about the evolution of three key aspects of the automotive industry. One, technology changes for vehicle data networks that connect systems. Two, business changes in who does software development and where that work gets done. And three, changes in approach to, approaches to adopting new technology. Let's first talk about the evolution of shared data and data networks. This is called data sharing the hard way, right? Consider this. This graphic shows a mechanical speedometer system, right? Just for those of you who may never have studied one of these, just briefly, what is it, right? A small gear, sometimes called the speedo gear, meshes with the final drive of the transmission and has just the right number of teeth such that you can compensate for the gearing of the differential and the size of the tires because when we build cars, they don't all have the same differential gearing and they don't all have the same size tires. This gear would then drive a stiff but flexible cable that would rotate and the other end of the cable would be connected to a mechanical speedometer which would turn the angular velocity of that cable into an angular displacement of the needle, right? Very simple. You've all seen at least one end of that business. You've probably, very few of you, have seen the other end of that business. This worked just fine until engine controls wanted to know the speed of the car. Now what do you do? A, a, a computer that's doing engine control doesn't read a speedometer by itself very well. So as we often do when adding new capabilities to an existing production product, rather than re-engineer the whole thing to something that might be simpler, we, we want to affect as few parts as possible, so we often just graft on a new piece of a solution. So when we needed to get engine speed over to engine controls here, what we did is we added an optical encoder to the mechanical speedometer. So we went from mechanical back to electrical, right? Which will sound okay at least for a while. Then we created a pulse train that showed the speed. Or it's proportional to speed, excuse me. And eventually, more features needed speed. So what did we do? Well, we just added more open collector outputs, right? Why? Again, just change one part, and then all the new parts came along too. But again, working to change as few parts as possible. The evolution continues, and as time went by, we did eventually invent some single point-to-point, monodirectional, uh, very simple serial data interfaces so we could move some pieces of data along. And then finally, we actually did get rid of the mechanical cable, right? It was just a matter of time. And we moved the, uh, that shouldn't say speedometer gear. 
Uh, yeah, I guess it should. There still has to be a, ga a gear ratio there. But basically, we made it so that the pulse train was being created right at the transmission. And finally, when we got to the next major overhaul of the entire electrical system, uh, we eventually went and moved all of the uh, speed signals to serial data and just shared it between the controllers like that. This evolution took about 10 years from the first need for an electronic speed signal until we got to the point where all of those mechanical speedometer cables had been eliminated. 10 years. Only 30 more to go, right? We just went through one decade. So if you think about it, right, change was very slow. So let's speed this up now and just go by decade and talk in, in more abstract terms about network, uh, network architecture and, and how it's put together. So right, once we started out with this point-to-point -point type of uh, monodirectional communication, right? Um, and this was great, you know, a few new features could be added, but the problem was that any time you wanted to add anything else, you had to, again, change both ends of it, the new part as well as the old part, so that you could uh, uh, be able to transmit the data. Because we didn't want to do this, right, this led us now to a, a synchronized multi-drop system, synchronized in the way that data was scheduled, right, so that um, each node uh, was given a time slot with which to write the data, and all data was always transmitted periodically. Uh, and it was uh, basically, uh, there was no collision detection, nothing like that. It was just, just basically very tightly synchronized, which was fine until you loaded that bus up so much that there weren't enough idle periods between anything. And so then you said, well, this isn't going to work anymore. We'll have to go to something else, something more sophisticated. The next step in the evolution was almost really the opposite of multi-drop, which was instead of having uh, everybody uh, write at different times, this was a method that did have collision detection and arbitration, and basically um, each unit would wait for a certain period of idle time and then would go to transmit its data. And there was also a, uh, in the front of the packet, there were some uh, priority codes and so basically, if, say, three different nodes were trying to transmit at once, everybody would transmit and then read. And as long as they were reading what they transmitted, which, of course, is only a one or a zero, they would keep talking. But the minute they didn't see what they wrote, they'd say, that's a collision and I should stop talking. So that way, that's how collisions were arbitrated. And if you think about it, no data was lost because if everybody was writing a one and ones were going out, it didn't matter if they were writing on top of each other. Similarly, of course, with zeros. This worked for quite some time, too. Um, but you did have to balance carefully your choices of idle, idle times, idle timing, if you will, and uh, priorities to make sure that data moved appropriately to where you wanted it, when you wanted it. And of course, as more features and complexity came, uh, the ECUs had to actually be organized in individual electrical buses such that you had enough capacity or timing because we couldn't just keep speeding things up to uh, 10 gigabit ethernet type speeds, things like that we do today, right? Um, so the idea would be is that you'd uh, organize organize the controllers that needed to share the most data on the same buses, and then some of the nodes that were doing real work would also become gateway nodes, too, for certain data, not all data. So the little nodes you see with triangles would also be gating certain data from one bus to another. And interestingly, too, each of these buses was, in, in some cases, different. If you'd go to some cars and look at them, uh, you'd see that some were low speed, mid speed, high speed, some are CAN, some were a uh, General Motors proprietary method. Why? Because each time we needed more, we just grabbed the next one and put it on. And we would make the gateway modules do the heavy lifting of any translation between the two at a data level, not at an electrical level. So today, 
we've come to the point where some nodes do nothing but gate or switch, if you will, right? Data from, from uh, one node to the next. And sometimes there needs to be more than one path to a node. An example might be in a safety critical type of uh, uh, usage in an autonomous car. For example, steering, right? If you're getting a signal to steer the car and it's only coming from one place and something happens to that wire, that could be a problem, right? So we have to make sure that uh, those safety critical end nodes there you see donate, uh, denoted with an S are in fact able to get data from uh, more than one source. And uh, if you kind of look at this briefly, you'll see that most of the time uh, you can get data from everywhere, even with some, a number of single point or switch failures. Is what involved? You said voting. Voting. Yeah, voting. voting. No, this is that. Okay, so there's no since this is a networking discussion, right? You're talking about at the next layer down, and let's let's talk about that in uh, in Q and A afterwards, okay? Because you're getting into what's inside the compute, and that's just one of these little nodes here, okay? We can talk about that uh, afterwards. Now, okay, good. So, so this is, as you can see, again, it's evolutionary, right? We've kind of caught up to today on where we are in some of our most sophisticated vehicles that have a lot of data that needs to be moved around, right? And this is basically uh, all in, in uh, some of, again, our most sophisticated cars moving this, this type of architecture, moving to use Ethernet protocols, both, uh, um, you know, all the way up to and including 10 gigabit. Some of the things you saw on the previous page may still exist, too, okay? Because, again, as we're taking uh, the Chevrolet Bolt that you saw earlier and adding autonomous systems to it, we're not going to change the entire car at this point in time, right? We're going to take and use the existing system, and then as we add the autonomous uh, control systems that need to have more data and move more data more quickly, we're adding this system in on top of it. When we go and do our next autonomous car, which might be a complete from the ground up all new car and might look like something you've never seen before, we'll probably redo the whole system. So over those years, right, as the business or the, I should say, the architecture of serial data was changing, so is the way that we're doing business in software. In the late 70s and early 80s, most of the EE systems really consisted of a singular dedicated controller with a set of dedicated sensors and a set of dedicated either actuators or displays, depending on what it was doing. And there was really very little shared data between the systems, much like you saw with speed data being moved around eventually by serial data. Um, in most cases, the design work, all aspects of it, whether it be feature description, what are you trying to do, system architecture, how are you going to lay it out and break it up, uh, controller hardware design and controller software were all done uh, in-house because that's where the application understanding was. In other words, if it's engine controls, all of that is, was really inside General Motors. And the fact also that we were highly vertically integrated, right, with uh, the component divisions that we had, and we would uh, uh, basically, you know, source them to ourselves or insourcing, as it's called, right? Um, there were exceptions to this, and most of the time it was on uh, newer, low volume things that we didn't really have application uh, understanding of inside the company. For example, one of my first assignments uh, out of college was I was an instrument cluster engineer. That's the, uh, full, that's the thing in front of you that's got all the different gauges. We call it an cl instrument cluster. And uh, one of the guys in the Pontiac design studio, right, they're always thinking, always drawing, coming up with new ideas, drew an instrument cluster with a speedometer, tachometer, a number of things, and drew a very stylized 
uh, compass display in there, heading north, south, east, west, right? And it had a very interesting way it rotated. And he, he said, and we're going to make this out of a vacuum fluorescent tube. And I said, where are you going to get the signal for that? And he goes, oh, I never thought of that, right? He knew, how, he knew all about displays because he was the guy making the displays. He just assumed that, that a, a, an automotive level compass sensor that detected magnetics was available. Well, it wasn't, okay? So I said, that's okay, we'll go work on that. So I went back to my boss and I said, hey, these guys want this new sensor. And he says, well, we don't have one of those. And I said, can I go try to make one? And he said, okay, you've got three months to come back to me to tell me that you know enough about it, that there's somebody who can build it with quality and you can get it for less than $25. I think it was what he told me. Was that you, Harvey? Did you tell me that? It wasn't you? Okay. Probably not, Probably not you. All right. Anyway, uh, so, right? In three months, uh, we had to figure out what we wanted. We had to go find people who, who thought they could make it because there, were, there was no in-house application uh, smarts, if you will, about magnetic compass sensing, right? Uh, so eventually, we did find three, four different suppliers who already had some work going on in that area. We were able to work with them to lay out what we wanted the performance requirements to be. And, of course, we had to design a point-to-point -point serial data system at that time because there was no way really to move the data between this sensor that actually had to be in the back of the car away from all of the other electronics so that it didn't get uh, interfered with because filtering was not that good at the time. Uh, and we ended up outsourcing both the hardware and software design. So again, why? because we didn't have any in-house expertise and because it was a relatively low volume niche product in some ways. We probably produced maybe, I don't know, 15,000 units a year with that feature. In the 90s, right? Uh, the scope and content of individual, of individual systems was growing, right? Everybody, we were adding different things. But again, most of these systems were still very standalone, and they only shared data on a, on a limited basis, mostly for display purposes and open loop control of actuators, windows, uh, popping the trunk, you know, things like that. It was really very open loop process, not a lot of tight integration or anything like that. And another big thing that was going on is that suppliers had recognized the opportunity now that we were um, making it such that data could at least be shared between systems and the fact that uh, uh, they had become pretty good at laying out these standalone systems and frankly in selling them to us too, particularly again in areas where we didn't have a lot of application uh, understanding. But in these key areas that you see here, these were still pretty much in-house but hadn't really become very integrated. Interestingly too, in 1999 was when Delphi Automotive was spun off out of General Motors. And with all of that manufacturing and engineering went a lot of the application understanding that was in some of these areas, which only opened up more opportunity for other suppliers other than Delphi to come in and work with us uh, on, on how to make these systems uh, in cars. Again, very independent. And you'd think this would be a great thing, right? More choice, more uh, smart people out there working on things for us to bring into cars, and it really was for a period of time until the next cycle where he said, well, we might want to go resource or look to see where we're going to get the next one from, and then what we found out was we weren't always the best contract writers in the world, and we didn't own all of that software that they now had, and so if we were going to go to a new supplier, we would actually have to rewrite all that software again. Okay, and sometimes, you know, of course, if software, if, uh, excuse me, hardware platforms were changing fast enough, you'd probably have to port it over anyway, but the, the simple fact that sometimes we, they were still even going to use the same microprocessor, it just uh, became uh, a very big sinkhole for money in some regards because you just had to redo everything. And again, this was mostly, uh, I'm going to just... Uh, talk about this, the uh, engine and transmission controls 
uh, when Delphi was spun off, we did keep a lot of that in-house. So I'm really talking about the non-powertrain areas uh, when I talk about uh, that. Okay. So today's systems, right, they are much more integrated and their functional boundaries often do not reside in a single controller, right? There is often shared data and a lot of it even being used for closed loop real time control, um, either things that are, uh, you know, uh, sensed by uh, the system itself or by the customer. My favorite example of that is um, the blending of regenerative and friction brakes for electric cars. Because once a, an electric car comes to a stop, there is no more regenerative braking, right? The car has to be moving. So as the car is coming to a stop, you have to, and the regenerative braking is disappearing, you have to bring in friction brakes so that they always add up equivalently so that as a customer, you just feel a nice smooth braking as you're pushing the brake pedal. Another trend had been for feature domain understanding to be brought back in-house. All of that expertise and things that we lost when Delphi was spun off, um, it took a number of years really to um, rebuild some of that understanding. Some of it was done by uh, rehiring some of the people from Delphi, and some of it was done by bringing in new people uh, from the outside, you know, you talk about the revolving door in government, but you should see the revolving door in, in uh, suppliers and uh, the OE industry. It's almost as bad sometimes. Um, so this is very important because, again, uh, if you want to uh, really make your customer happy, you have to really understand what that application is doing and have already done the research and the market research as to uh, how you want it to work, what is considered good performance, bad performance, and, and we had to sort of reacquire some of that um, after, uh, after uh, the Delphi sale. I guess the only other thing I want to point out here too is the little bit in red down there, right? Um, right, we did bring the feature software in-house but because we were still interested in being able to buy hardware from a lot of different places, we would still uh, get with the hardware from the hardware design and supplier a board support package, which was basically the application software would sit on top of that. Some people call it board support. Some people call it BIOS software, a lot of different names for it. But basically the hardware, the uh, hardware specific part of the software so that then we could reuse. And that's fairly typical today, although not so typical 15 years ago. Right? So what's wrong with all this complexity and integration, right? Particularly when you're trying to do something that's just a little bit new, like making cars drive themselves, right? Um, think back to the example of 10 years to get rid of the mechanical speedometer cable. Um, how are we going to move quickly and safely into this new opportunity of autonomous cars, right? If, if we try to follow some of our old ways of doing things, we'll never get it done. Because our typical technology development process really doesn't move that quickly. And it's mostly because of the priorities that we have set as a business for our normal business, and we'll talk about that. So today's typical vehicle technology development process is a very sequential one, right? And I've taken this back about as far as it can go, right? We have the basic R&D work where we're just trying to figure out if we even know or understand the fundamentals, the physics, the, you know, the, the math, those kinds of things for something that we want to do, right? And if that's successful, we then go into what's called advanced technology work. This is the idea where we say, uh, okay, could I actually uh, make this into some kind of automotive product? After that, if, if we're successful, right, we would go into the Advanced Vehicle Development Center where we would figure out, can we support 
all the needs of what this subsystem is. And I'll give you an example of this in a minute. Uh, with the other things like energy, thermal support, mechanical packaging, mechanical protection, all the other things that would go with bringing that into a vehicle. And only then, if we're sure that we can get there, we put that then on a production timeline. And the reason that all of that is there in front is we are actually trying to minimize the risk to our production quality and performance on a fixed timeline. Why? Why is that so important? Capital investment, right? A vehicle assembly plant and is a huge capital investment. The tooling for making the vehicle, the tooling at the supplier to make some of the different parts, and not to mention the engineering design and development that you've dumped in and you're paying somebody for in advance as you're going through that. It is very important to hit your mark and get that thing in production on time. So we make sure that we've gone through these very basic steps, but we don't even talk about it and see that little thing, DSI there. We, you, you might not even know we're working on it in the public until we're all the way out there. And even then, you might still not know about it. Interestingly, too, um, in our industry, and particularly uh, in my company, we've we've actually become kind of uh, comfortable with this. And that's not good, right? That's not something that's going to allow us to be first. Uh, what was it uh, this morning that the dean said? Uh, C-I-D, daring. Was that it? Daring. This isn't very daring, right? Daring is a fancy word for nice risk or favorable risk or likely favorable outcome of risk, right? Not very daring. If we want to be first, particularly in the autonomous vehicle market, right, we're going to have to adopt a much more parallel process to this, that instead of uh, having the goals that I stated before, we need the goal to minimize time to market with an understood risk of quality and performance, right? An understood risk of quality and performance. The previous one said, Absolute quality in the retail market. Absolute performance that retail customers are used to. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that with our first autonomous vehicles, we're not going to go after the retail market. And part of it is because of what I just said there. Okay? The retail market expects something different. And I'm going to talk about the shared autonomous or transportation as a service market in a minute. Um, and this kind of thinking here makes a lot of people in my company very uncomfortable because it, it changes our whole process of what we do and how we do it. So this has taken some uh, preaching, if you will, to get people to, to, to think about this and operate because they're, they're uncomfortable with it, right? And, and that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable with it. Um, this means we have to think very carefully about which technologies to bring in to this process and when they're available and frankly when to say you know what this one's just not going to make it and kick it out kick it out early don't even try to take you just got to sometimes say it's just not going to make it it's not doing well enough soon enough fast enough we're not going to do that one anymore okay um, and this is another example of something that makes us very uncomfortable the idea that we would uh, I think there's a name for it, the paradox of sunk cost or something like that. We need any business students in here who can help me out. There's another, I don't know what it is. Um, the idea that, well, I've already put in, you know, I've already put in a quarter of a million dollars. I should put the other half a million in because I'm already this far in. Well, you know what? Sometimes that's not the right answer. Cut your losses and run, right? Get to the next thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, sometimes when you do this too, you're going to fail. You are going to have failures. What else did the dean say? He said, somebody asked today if um, he, they had an award for the most beautiful failure that was part of their uh, uh, incubator uh, activity. He said, no, we thought about that, but we didn't do it. I think they might, maybe he's going to do that now. But you're right, the most beautiful failure. There's nothing wrong with, with talking about it, your failures, believe me. Um. So as we do this too, um, typically in, 
in my, my industry, right? We do things on a model year change basis, right? And we also know that as we're moving in an area like autonomous vehicles where technologies move so quickly that we probably can't do things on a model year basis. We may have to do things much more often than that. And so the idea is always be watching when the next technology is going to be ready. And we've got a lot of different things going in parallel, even in a single area like, say, cameras. OK? Uh, you know, cameras are moving quite quickly uh, in some of the different things that are available. And we're not going to wait for a model year to bring those things into our plans. So I mentioned earlier that, that, that one of the reasons that we can uh, do some of these things is that as we're working on autonomous vehicles, our plan is not to first take them into retail. Why? Probably because they would cost far too much, to, frankly. Okay? Just to be honest, right? They're going to be expensive, right? But if you put them into a shared autonomous vehicle fleet, and you use them for, say, transportation as a service. That's a fancy word for taxi, right? Uh, and you keep them highly utilized, where they're moving around and doing things right. There, it seems to make sense that you should be able to afford a much more expensive investment to run that business, right? Um, and we think that we can do that, put vehicles into that kind of market without Again, defining the appropriate quality and performance targets without any impact first to overall safety. Safety is our number one priority, okay? And uh, no, Im no uh, uh, unfavorable impact by the customer. They will have good ride quality. They will get from point A to point B and, and enjoy it. So the reason also that this is good, is concerns that in a retail fleet we would otherwise have to engineer out things like long-term durability. You know, maybe a sensor uh, is only going to last, I don't know, two years. That would make you very unhappy if you owned the car, right? If you didn't own the car and we updated sensor technologies or they actually had, uh, they wore out because they had some aspect of them that, that did, did, the durability couldn't last more than two years, as long as, again, you're getting a good ride and it's safe and we make sure that we're changing that sensor on a regular basis, periodic maintenance, pre-launch pre checks, whatever it takes, right? As a user of transportation as a service, you're probably going to be fine with that and you'll probably never know it, right? That's, and that's the idea. So we can, we, uh, we can manage some of our challenges like that. Um, also, in a shared autonomous fleet, we can make sure that we don't send the car out to do something that it can't do with safety and ride quality. For example, if the sensor sensing system can't look up a 16% grade, then we won't take that autonomous vehicle up a 16% grade. We'll go around it or come find some other way. Or if for some reason the whole world where you want to be is nothing but a 16% grade, maybe we'll have to have drivers to take people up and down those 16. I know it's a, kind of absurd. Everyone this way has to have a driver and everyone that goes this way around the curve, right? That would be an autonomous vehicle. But you, I think you get the idea. Uh, and then the great thing too is as the technology continues to advance as we get able to, if you will, look up that 16% grade and still do all the other things, right? We can slowly expand the mission that we can do with autonomous vehicles uh, uh, to eventually cover the entire uh, area that you want to cover. And there's also another good thing about going shared autonomous first. And remember before I said we weren't going to go retail? to begin, eventually we will want to go retail. And so if you think about it, one of the things that you read about and you hear about and you see are people saying, I don't ever want to get in an autonomous car, or oh, this is terrible, you know, the, um, or it's going to be unsafe, it's going to be this, it's going to be that, right? Everybody who doesn't know has an opinion. If your first experience with an autonomous car can be a simple one that doesn't cost you a lot of money, right? Takes you across town. Uh, takes you from the airport to a hotel, whatever it is, right? 
and it's a good experience, then when we do get to the point of having retail units available for sale, it'll make a lot more sense to you and you'll already be through some of that experiential uh, activity and you won't be quite so afraid of it. Because frankly, there are a whole group of people who are afraid. That's fine. It's going to happen. They won't be afraid until they get a chance to get experience, see experience, hear it from other people. It's just like a lot of new things that happen. So, from mechanical speedometers and punch cards to connectivity and the ethernet of autonomous cars, think of it that way, the ethernet of things, the ethernet of autonomous cars, excuse me, internet, not ethernet, I should have said, right? 40 years, is, there's been a lot of change, both here at the university, both in the things that I've had a chance to experience and in how technology has moved through the industry. I guess I have to really think about it you know, I'm very thankful for the opportunities that were available to me through my family, my neighbors, my university, and of course, good old General Motors, who has given me really the chance to be involved in all sorts of, of different things. And it's made for an interesting career so far. Stay tuned for more. Thank you. <laughs>